and being able to share uh, his slides about the, the the state of the business industry. Hello, Jed. How are you? Hey, Mary. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no you. problem. One of the best thought leaders on about, uh, let's say, the economy of APIs, uh, how investment works in the API uh, industry. So, yeah, I invite you to share your screen with us. Yes, can you see? Uh, not yet. Now we can see it. Perfect. You can put full screen. Thank you. Very good. Uh, I'll get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, spending your time here today to, to listen. It's a really uh, an honor and a privilege to, to be presenting to all of you. So um, I just want to start out by, by sharing a little bit about uh, my background and work. You know, my journey in, in API started about three years ago. Uh, when I flew across, you know, the ocean from Tokyo to Silicon Valley, uh, I ended up um, in a WeWork, and this was back when WeWork was a, a pretty hot tech company. Uh, talking to the CEO of a small startup at the seed stage with five other employees. Now, what came out of that di discussion and uh, was a, a deal to to build um, an API marketplace. And looking at this slide, I'm sure you can guess very quickly that the company I met with was Rapid API. They've gone on to raise funding from Andreessen Horowitz and Microsoft Ventures. And today, you know, we serve million scales of developers with tens of thousands of APIs. Now, if I had to sum up our, our mission, um, looking at this, right, it, it comes down to two things. The first one was. Uh, for API providers to help them be successful across, you know, our million scale developer um, community. And if you're a developer, it was about unifying their experience end to end, uh, solving the developer experience, which I fundamentally believe is, is a problem today when it comes to APIs, so that they can find the right APIs for their use cases, they can do testing and integration easily, they can also do management in terms of payments uh, and analytics on the platform. And, and the reason I, I talk about all of this is that, you know, I consider myself privileged in being able to be involved in this because the way that our business uh, made money and, and thrive was about making the market. It was about facilitating transactions, and that is our lifeblood. And I think generally that is what's good for all of us here today at this conference and what allows us to, to do the things that we're so passionate about. And so this is from the perspective from which I'll be speaking today. So the first point I wanna make is, is on this idea of APIs being a relatively new business model, right? As a technology, they've been around for about 20 years. But as a business model, it's a relatively new pheno phenomenon. So this graph that you see on this slide is, is Google Trends data for two terms, SOAP API in red and REST API in blue. What's always interesting to me is that both of these uh, protocols actually were created within two years of each other. SOAP got a lot of early traction because they had industry backing right, from a, from a consortium. Uh, but over time, you see REST catching up. Um, and, and I think developers adopted SOAP in a grassroots, uh, sorry, adopted REST in a grassroots manner for, for a couple of very simple reasons. One is that REST was more lightweight and responsive than SOAP, uh, and JSON output was more human readable than, than XML and made it easier to use. So there's a pretty powerful corollary here in this story about listening to our users. And this slide also shows that it was around 10 years ago, towards the end of 2008, that REST caught up with SOAP in popularity. And if we take the same data set and extrapolate it today, it's not even a contest anymore, right? So for the first time ever, we more or less have a, a de facto standard for consuming APIs in the form of REST. Yes, there are some technical advancement and merits around e uh, gRPC uh, around GraphQL or async, but broadly REST um, dominates today and is what we're all used to. Now, roughly in the same time, we saw the rise of pure play API first companies. 
right? So these are companies that use APIs. Number one is a technology for distribution. And number two, uh, as a unit of monetization, right? We are all, all familiar with the logos here on this slide with Stripe and Adyen um, establishing the, the category of payment processing. We know SendGrid for transactional emails and we know Twilio for calls and SMS and CPAS. And it's pretty hard to imagine, you know, the traction that's going on and the, the, the exponential growth that these companies have experienced. When you put in the context that 14 years ago, none of these companies existed. In 2014, around there, uh, these companies started hitting billion dollar valuations. And, and that was pretty big news at the time. And you think about that in the last six years, these companies have gone from a billion to 20 or 30 or 40 billion dollars plus. And I think all of this validation in the market, the proving out of these business models and the robustness of APIs as a technology to distribute service, uh, we're gonna see a big influx of, of companies coming in. While we have categories like payment processing, communications, and email already established, I'm I'm very bullish that we're going to see you know new sectors emerge like B2B data, uh, KYC, or or even search functionality. The next point I'm going to make is about you know success driving uh, the new wave of of API companies. By some estimates today, there are over 30,000 public APIs out there. And if you look on programmable webs directory, you know, they grow that directory by about 40% year over year. And so I think what we're seeing here is um, the idea of API business models becoming more mainstream and a big wave of, um, of players, of startups coming into this space to try and build valuable new companies out of them. And I think that because of this growth in the number of public APIs, there's a, a big risk of API providers being trapped in, in what I call a, a digital ocean, right? And the idea is this. this, this pie chart here on this slide is from Apigee's 2016 State of APIs report. And what the story tells is that the top 25% of APIs actually consume 90% of call traffic across their enterprise user base. Now, if we take that same pattern, uh, and extrapolate it to the wider API economy, it's not a stretch of the imagination to say that, hey, you know what? If you're a small API company, you're probably in those orange slices. You have a digital, purely digital product that exists on the internet in the form of your API. It's theoretically frictionless, but it's very hard. It can be hard for you to be found and therefore to be successful. Now, the two things that I've talked about here today um, so far, uh, the first thing I've talked about is about proliferation of APIs. The second is around developer experience. Right? Now, I've already discussed about uh, the growth of APIs and, and how that's going to make the landscape more crowded. I personally don't think it's a matter of just more players because there is uh, room for depth and diversity in, in each of these categories or spaces where they play. So take, for example, the cat area of CPaaS. You know, broadly speaking, people might say, hey, you know what, um, there are, there's no more room to play because there are three uh, incumbents uh, that are established. There is Twilio, there's um, Nexmo or Vonage, and then there is also Telesign. But actually, in the last 12 months, we saw um, interesting activity in the form of uh, WaveCell, which is a Singapore-based um, CPaaS player getting acquired by 8x8 for about $250 million. And by the same token, in India, because of local market conditions or regulations, uh, there's an SMS player called Message91 that's growing really quickly as well. Now, for your users, uh, imagine with all of these APIs being having this challenge of identifying the right providers for their use case. Right? And with thousands out there, it, it gets pretty hard. And let's say they can whittle this down into uh, a few relevant players, uh, a, a small subset to, to deep dive into. What they're left with is to have to manually sift through uh, dev portals to understand the propositions for each of these pro providers. 
And, and let's say each API provider had up-to-date documentation, a beautiful portal, interactive uh, sandbox, and, and all of these things that make it easier. Going through all of this is necessarily time consuming and, and, and manual, and that's pretty difficult. And believe it or not, we're still only at the start of this process. Besides discovery and the manual processing of these providers, our users get stuck with access problems where instead of being self-service, access to an API might be approval based. Pricing might be opaque, so they don't know what it costs, or they might not be trial plans available. So you've got to put down budget against something even before you know it's what you need. They might grapple with policy updates and changes that result in APIs being deprecated or endpoints being changed suddenly. Our users struggle with connecting to APIs because of, of poor tooling, uh, the lack of a self-subscription option, and, and probably consider you know, very carefully, uh, is it worth it having a, a performance dependency on this public API? Can I trust them or are they going to break my application? And finally, through your application lifecycle, you've got to deal with the management part of it, which probably is the most time consuming. Because for every single API or provider that you have, you need to maintain a separate account. You need to maintain a separate key or token for each API service. Every month, you've got to pay a different provider. You've got separate dashboards for every API and, and no way to unify this tracking. Now, these two themes that I've talked about, number one, growth of public APIs, and second, developer experience are kind of got what got me and Mehdi thinking and, and working with the API Days team uh, in the background for the last few months. So I want to take this opportunity to share a, a couple of big initiatives. So the first one is the API landscape. Uh, what we've done is we've rolled out a brand new framework for the API landscape. It incorporates new interactivity uh, and, and a much better, easier way for us to update uh, all of these companies so that we've got our finger on the pulse. So you can find this on api-landscape.com. I've included a link here. Uh, and as a call to action, uh, we're also initiating a research project to, to understand the trends in the space better. Uh, and this is primarily targeted at seed stage and later companies. I provided a link there in case anybody's listening and wants to participate. The second new initiative is something called api-fund.vc. I could probably start right here because you can guess from the name what this is all about. But we're really proud of this, so I'm just going to talk about it for about 30 seconds. Our mission and vision here is that we want to be the only fund that's dedicated to API for startups because we think we can deliver asymmetric returns to investors and bring unfair advantage to the portfolio companies. And that comes in three ways. Number one, we want to help uh, early stage founders, technical founders, solve their, their first capital problem, right? So they don't have to go to friends and family or to generalist investors and explain what an API is and why it matters. The second is we think we can provide privileged access to playbooks and expertise by connecting them through our network of entrepreneurs, founders, and operators who have built and exited from, from valuable API companies. And finally, it's about access to community and also a C-suite to help these companies grow. Now, again, I've included links in case anybody sees this and is interested and wants to get in touch with us. And our investment themes are three things. Number one, APIs as products. Second, API tooling companies. And thirdly, API platforms. So with this, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, how I look at the API economy from an investor point of view. Now, in a study uh, in 2017 that did an examination of uh, 58, um, 58 enterprises, it was found that API adoption contributed 10.3% to market value. So that's a pretty stark um, there's, there's a pretty stark statement right there, right? So what's actually driving all of this? Now, if you ask me to uh, explain all of this, um, here's, here would be my argument. If I had to position APIs against a sector like software or SaaS, and it comes down to four reasons. Number one, if you're an API company, your single product or your infrastructure that you build with an API wrapper basically serves all digital infra 
interfaces, no matter what your user is building, whether it's SaaS, a web application, native mobile or plugin, all you have to worry about is having infrastructure that works. Right? You don't have to differentiate and allocate resources to, to compete on the front end. That, that really isn't all that, um, all, all that much of a, of a difference maker. The second one is that APIs are, are technically quick and easy to integrate as long as they are well-documented and well-designed. And your users not only are accustomed to self-service integration, they probably prefer it. So if you're an API provider, it means shorter and more efficient sales cycles and a lot lower sales and marketing spend uh, per dollar of revenue compared to traditional SaaS. The third argument I make is that um, API business models are, are pay-as-you-go pricing, which means that adoption barriers are a lot lower. So if you're developing an application today and there is a public third-party API that's off the shelf and fits your use case, there is absolutely no getting around the cost effectiveness um, of using a public API versus building and maintaining in-house. Absolutely not. There are, of course, other reasons why you would, um, you, would, you would be concerned about using a public API, but cost should never be one of them. Now, if you're an API provider, it means that since um, your service is pay per use, your revenue actually scales alongside your customer's gr growth or usage in a much closer way than SaaS. And this makes API services platforms in and of themselves. And the final reason I propose is that APIs have much better churn or stickiness characteristics compared to SaaS. That's because while APIs are, are technically easy to integrate and, and actually remove, it actually introduces a big breakage risk to the application. So once you're into an application, in order for somebody to swap you out, they've actually got to provide um, your users a much better proposition in terms of both cost and or quality. Right. And these are the qualitative reasons, but let's look at some data. You know, to make this comparison, what I did was to look at public markets since we have the best liquidity and tri pr price transparency. Um, and at the same point in time, I looked at comparables of SaaS companies versus APIs. On the SaaS side, I picked Atlassian and Zoom. So at the time that this was taken, Atlassian and Zoom were probably two of the hottest SaaS stocks out there, and they, they probably still are today. And the mo public markets were valuing their revenues at 25 to 50x. But if we look at API companies, and I pick Adyen and Twilio here, that revenue multiple on valuation uh, turns out to be 75 to 100x. And I think somewhere in between the difference of these averages, it, it tells a pretty interesting story. There definitely is something here that, that says API company, API company revenues are much more valuable than SaaS. <coughs> Excuse me. So as an investor, I naturally have to dive into reasons of actually what this is, right? So to explain this idea, uh, I'm going to go into some common venture metrics on revenue. And here are the four of them. There's unit revenue, gross margins, uh, and retention, re revenue retention on a gross and net basis. Now, if you look at conventional venture logic, they will tell you that SaaS beats APIs on unit revenue because the price points are a lot higher and also gross margins for exactly the same reason. But if you look at the other side of the graph on revenue retention, the picture is, is actually opposite, right? That APIs outperform SaaS in terms of revenue retention. And so if API companies are receiving higher revenue multiples, it must be on the right side of this graph, not the left. Right? So it's worth looking into this. Now, I'm going to take a, a second to explain uh, net revenue retention because it is not as commonly understood a, a venture metric uh, compared to, uh, let's say, something like MRR, monthly recurring revenue. The formula for net revenue retention is this. You take a company starting MRR you subtract off downsell. So these are companies, existing companies, that have reduced their usage. You subtract churn. So these are companies or customers who have completely left uh, your service. And then you add ex expansion revenue. 
So this is companies who are existing uh, and they have actually scaled up usage. And you take all of this and divide it by starting MRR. The, the output of this formula is a percentage, right? It basically gives you a calculation of what percentage of your existing customers um, have have your existing customers increase or decrease spend on your platform within within a given time period, right? So let's take a couple of examples quickly. Uh, at the bottom here on this table, you see company number one. They had a starting revenue of ten thousand dollars. They had a thousand dollars of downsell, uh, five hundred dollars of churn, and they had twenty five hundred of expansion revenue and zero new customers. According to MRR, they ended this period with eleven thousand uh, dollars, but their NRR, the net revenue retention for calculation, is at one hundred and ten percent. So they've grown on the back of existing customers. Company number two also had a starting MRR of ten thousand dollars. They lost two thousand to downsell. They lost five hundred to churn. They got zero of expansion revenue uh, and five thousand of new customers. Here, their MRR looks healthier at 12,500, but actually NRR is lower, right? And so the point I'm trying to make here is that for company number one that has grown through existing customers, um, it's a healthier company. Whereas company number two, looking at MRR, it's incomplete because new customer acquisition is covering up your churn problem. And you know, my argument here is that API companies um, they they benefit from uh, looking benefit from uh, NRR as a metric, right? And here are the three reasons why. Again, starting with this formula, um, I think on downsell, API companies are less exposed to downsell than SaaS. And in fact, as your custom number of customers grow, usage becomes more predictable and stable. And if you're an API company, often your usage is driven by your customers' users. So if your customer is experiencing massive churn on that side, it's probably not a good customer to have in the first place. Now, this idea of stable, predictable revenue is actually quite valuable because if you look at Twilio in the early days of them being public, one of the knocks against their stock uh, was that their high dependency on Uber and WhatsApp as, as two prominent customers. On the churn side, we've already talked about this, and I think we can all agree that APIs have better churn characteristics than SaaS. Uh, and the last thing on expansion revenue, I think APIs have a much higher expansion potential than SaaS. That's because your API usage scales in tandem with your customer growth. And if you're an API company, you actually have much better potential than SaaS to leverage growth on growth by using horizontal APIs or bundling strategies of complementary services. So the last thing I'm going to talk about today is, OK, again, as an investor, um, what is my framework for a, a great API company? If I was deploying capital today for API-fund.vc, how would I look at this problem? And I think this is uh, my lens right now. It comes down to, to four different boxes, right? The first one is in value creation and defensibility. In order to, to build a, a successful, valuable API company, firstly, you need to be tackling a sufficiently large market. Second, you need to be clear about your source of value, and that differs whether you're a horizontal or a vertical API. Uh, and the third thing is how are you defending against competition? Like, What are your sources of defensibility? On value capture, I think the questions to ask is, are you providing a business critical service? Secondly, do you, are you developing something that your customers lack competence to bring in-house so you can get, cannot get this intermediated? And the third thing is, can you use network effects in your service development to sustain a competitive advantage and keep customers bound to you? For tailwinds, Something to look at is, is your service building into some rising tide? It might be an emerging e-commerce platform, a rising new technology, or some key trend. And finally, for organic adoption, we know that the earliest users, the first people that go hands-on with your code, even before there's an API or a developer portal, are, are developers. 
So a developer showing your uh, your product love, you know, for instance, by engaging with your GitHub repo. We talked about how APIs have lower gross margins, so you need to uh, watch your customer acquisition cost, which basically means getting your market stack right. Now, I'm just going to do a quick deep dive into one thing and, and end it in the interest of time. Uh, I'll do uh, talk a little bit about the first box on value creation and defensibility. Um, sorry about that. So the way I look at value creation and defensibility, it's on these things. On value creation, uh, it, it depends whether you're a vertical or horizontal API, right? If you're vertical, the challenge is about solving fragmentation or complexity so that your customers can scale quickly. That's your source of value to users or to customers. And often the industry characteristics that we are see is that there are many suppliers or providers for a specific function. And it's actually really hard to do technical integrations because um, there's no standards that exist or these existing suppliers are using it as a barrier. And the example here is, for instance, how Twilio Switch stitched telco networks together globally using software. And if you're a horizontal API, it's about building complementary related services to build a platform. Often the characteristics that we see is that there are few standalone services uh, in the SaaS side because it appears that it lacks sufficient value. Right, so the example here that I like to cite is, uh, think about a company like fastc.co, which is a checkout service, right? Um, it made a lot of sense for Stripe to invest in them and presumably for them to use Stripe de facto for payments. Now, you know, maybe with the uh, announcement of Stripe Treasury, you can, the ability to offer virtual bank accounts and into holding balances for, uh, for e-commerce companies, you know, that increases the pool of value. And when it comes to defensibility, I think here are things to look at. Number one, what you're getting defensibility about around is your investment in time, cost, and effort. That's the primary thing. It can also arise from geographic footprint, for instance, market access, or it could be down to market regulation. It's a key market, you are a local player, and you need to be local in order to, to tackle that market. The next thing is around network effects, right? And network effects can arise from a few different sources. One is having more providers on your platform. The example here might be Plaid's banking network as they grow the number of banks on their platform. We really need the, to wrap up the, sorry. Sure. Um, it could be around data. It could be around usage. And I think for incumbents, uh, there could be a defensibility because there's lack of standards or protocols or incumbents that, that frankly are not interested on, on doing this and use technical integrations as a barrier. Um, but that's my time. Uh, I will stop here and um, just share my contact info. Um, I'll share these slides after. There's a link to our API landscape research project. Uh, and if any of you want to reach out to me, you can reach out at jed at api-fund.pc. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you, Jed. Thank you very much. Uh, the 25 minutes were worth it. Uh, for question, you can type question in the chat, but we need to go to the next uh, speaker. You can go on api-landscape.com to know more about the API Landscape or contact Jed on api-fund.vc, an initiative I manage with you, uh, Jed, uh, uh, to be completely transparent. Thank you for your presentation, uh, 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 Jed. Thank you very much. And now we have our next